So it's often the case that when we live abroad, it's then that we appreciate what we had at home. Like if you've ever lived anywhere apart from England or Ireland for a long period of time and you come home and finally you get a cup of tea, like it's supposed to be made. The only way, it's, I remember I was, I was in Italy when I was going to seminary there and I was um, getting a coffee in a, in a bar or something and um, the waiter came over to a couple uh, and he said, uh, yes, and uh, so they, they said, um, uh, two teas, sir, please, two teas. And he looked at them and he said, um, hot or, uh, or cold? Hot, Jerry, do you hear that? Cold, hot, hot, scalding. <laughs> they would never heard of iced tea, you know what I mean? Like, and then even, even if you do, even if they do bring you tea, it's tea, they probably bring you the hot water in a, in a kind of a jug and the tea bag. It's the most miserable tea you ever get. But then like, or then like the, the French, for example, when they come here, they, um, they come here usually for our weather, because our weather here in Ireland is just fantastic. Um, but I think when they go home, they then have a particular tear when they see, and maybe even smell, le baguette. That first, that first morning when they get to finally <laughs> you know, or like again in Italy, uh, having table wine, which is kind of a normal thing, and it's for them, it's the cheap wine. Cheap is like to be top drawer by our standards, like top drawer stuff, just, just something that they're casually thrown there on the table. Then they come to Ireland where we don't know anything about wine. I think when they go home, then they must really just relish, oh my goodness, like. So often what we have, what we have in front of us, we just we completely take for granted. See, for us here in Ireland, because faith was so integral to everything, our education system and our hospitals and our politics and our families and our feast days and our calendar, everything basically was arranged around this, this Christian faith. And so very quickly, if we don't understand what it's about or what it means, we can cheapen it. And familiarity breeds contempt. And so we can begin to completely take for granted this life-giving, this transforming, and this healing gift known as faith. But ah, sure, it's just, that's just the church, or it's just Mass, or it's just Holy Communion, or it's just that thing there the granny does. And we completely disregard and, and, and misunderstand it. And, and it's not that we've anything against it per se. We're not necessarily hostile to it. We just don't place any value in it. So then you've got people like John the Baptist, whose singular mission is to prepare the way for Jesus. And this like, is the perfect example for any and every missionary. Your job as a missionary is to prepare the way for Jesus, which means that just like if when you're building a road, right, you prepare the way, you have to level the hills, you have to, whatever you dig out of the hill, you throw into the next valley to try and fill that valley, and you're trying to make it as easy as possible. But then when the way is dug and leveled and filled, you get out of the way. You get the machinery off the road, right? It's not about you anymore. You've done the digging, you've done the filling, you're done. Get off the road. Sim similarly as, as a missionary, you prepare the way for the Lord. And then once the Lord comes, you get out of the way. It's not about you anymore. It never really was about you. But this is kind of, it's, again, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good image, I think, to have as a missionary. You know, w what we do then is we, we introduce people to the Lord and then we just get out of the way. Now, to, it's, like, it's like introducing a couple, isn't it? Jerry, this is Mary. Mary, this is Jerry. Enjoy yourselves. <laughs> you know? And then you head off. Just get out of the way. Don't be a gooseberry when Jesus is there. Just let him, let him work on the soul, you know? Incidentally, I got some statistics during the week that our number one viewership is coming from the States. And our number one viewership in the States is California. So if anyone out there listening to me doesn't understand what I'm saying, humblest apologies. Um, I speak with some fairly thick Irishisms on a regular basis. So uh, apologies if you don't know, uh, understand everything I'm saying. But today we're focusing on, on St. John the Baptist and him preparing the way for the Lord. Now. This great commission has been issued to all of us. Go make disciples of all the nations. 
This is the mission of the church, and we're all a part of the church. So this, this, this great commission has been given to each one of us to go make disciples. So all of us are called to be like John the Baptist and prepare the way. So how do we prepare the way for anyone to meet the Lord? Well, firstly, by your prayer, by the way, not just, not just because you're such a wonderful, powerful, saintly theologian that you can just convince people. It doesn't work that way. We pray for them. We pray for them in hiddenness first. Then the Lord may well provide an opportunity to talk. Good, use that. But it's his work. It's his work. Even like from our little chapel here, people listen from throughout the countryside, like the whole country and the whole world. That's nothing we did. We just put a camera at the back of the chapel. I mean, the Lord, the Lord does it all. The Lord does it all. So it's, it's, it's very humbling to know that as, as, uh, as a, another St. John the Baptist, as a person like St. John the Baptist, we're preparing for an incredible encounter. We're preparing someone else's heart or helping someone else to have this incredible encounter with the Lord. There is no greater and no more important mission than that. Because that relationship, that encounter, that, that healing power transmitted in that relationship with the Lord, if that sets that soul up for eternity in heaven, eternity, there's nothing more valuable than that. And we get to be part of it. And just briefly, I think there are two main obstacles to us wanting to be missionary. One is probably we haven't always seen it done well. So, like a lot, in a lot, many of the Protestant churches, they've seen good, engaging preachers and teachers. Uh, in some of the Protestant denominations, you know, music is a very vibrant part of their celebration. So, you can bring someone along to a uh, a, a more music-based praise and worship session or something, and it looks impressive. So you can, you know, you can, you can kind of be proud of it. You bring them along and say, yeah, this is, uh, this is what I believe. It's the church I belong to. It's going to be awesome, you know, and have these theater seats and a big band and a big stage. And it's, it's you know, it's, it's low-key. It's not, it's, not, it's not like hardcore theology. It's just, it's worship. So, you know, it's easy. It's easy. Um, but, but you can be kind of proud and, you know, in a good sense. You can be proud of your church and you invite people to it and there you go, this is what I believe. And you can see, it's credible. Okay, for us, when we say this is what I believe, they might come into a church and just have no idea what any of this is. Or have no idea what any of these readings mean. And no idea what the Eucharist is and just not get it. And then we may not have seen very many people who witness to the faith very well. Like, I mean, if, do we have good preaching in every parish or in most parishes? Maybe, maybe not. Do we have engaging liturgy? Maybe, maybe not. So it makes it a little bit harder for us then to confidently invite people. But secondly, and probably more importantly, I think when it comes to a reluctance to engage in mission or in ministry, I think a lot of that comes from fear. Good old-fashioned fear of rejection. Fear of people saying, nah, people saying, nah, your, your, your faith is odd or weird or it makes you different or just fear. Good old-fashioned fear. And it stops us then from carrying on this John the Baptist-like vocation of preparing the way in someone else's heart for that encounter with the Lord. Fear. Fear of what others might think. Fear of not fitting in. Fear of being rejected. So, how do we resolve that? I remember talking to a, a very good missionary priest, and I said, "You must be so used to just going over to people now and talking to them and saying, you know, inviting them to mass or inviting them to confession or whatever it is." And he said, <laughs> "He said I find it so difficult," and I was amazed, shocked, because the guy is in his seventies. I said, but you're doing this all your life. He said, yeah, but it costs me every single time. I said, well, how do you keep doing it so? 
And he said, the one thing I have to keep saying to myself or reminding myself of is, Lord, I do this out of love for you. So we don't overcome fear by saying, I'm just going to be super courageous. We overcome fear with love. We overcome that fear of rejection with love for the Lord. And that's then what gives joy and, and also it's what might remove any maybe uh, arrogance in our approach. You know, it's all out of love for the Lord. Win, lose, or draw. All out of love for the Lord. So we ask the Lord today to remove, renew in each one of us that St. John the Baptist-like vocation to prepare the way for Jesus. And if it costs us, or if it's difficult, or if we experience that fear in our hearts, that we may overcome it through the love that we have for Jesus Christ. Amen.